Right, so I'm going to go through the um, question paper that I provided um, that I've written for the 2396 mock exam. It's the real assessment, and I actually gave a link to download it on the description of the previous video in Outcome 6. Instead of just giving answers as I would give them, what I'm doing really is I'm mainly going to highlight the points of reference that we should look at to get the idea of what the question is aimed at. So, just a quick just a quick reminder then so 10 questions there's the uh, the question paper if you wanted to look at it before we go through this they're 10 questions but they are 10 blown up questions and um, you have three hours to do it and remember this is an open book assessment so it's not so much about your ability to memorize it's about your ability to reference and use the documentation that's there so you know when I did this, I um, I did this previously. The the last one I did was two three nine one two zero. Um, I used the full three hours, and I literally filled the paper up. Uh, but basically, just because I was just waffling a little bit, but I've got a distinction on it. Um, but what I want to do is instead of showing you my blown up written answers, because I can probably sometimes overdo that, I'm just going to show you where the reference is. It's the best thing. Okay. So the very first question we had was this number one, a new five build, a new build five bedroom house connected to the distributor's two thirty volt single phase supply, formed part of a TNCS system, a metal framed and clad workshop. That's an important point. Will be located in the garden. Describe the requirements for both the building regulations and BS seven six seven one that is relevant to design considerations for each. As you can see, it's mentioning here building regulations and BS7671, so we need to be able to reference both. Now, as I've said throughout the 2396 series, it's important to have done regulations training or to have a good understanding on reference of the wine regulations. Similarly with the building regulations. Now, I'm not going to say you have to do a course on that. Um, most definitely don't do a Part P course. Um, best case would be the 2393 City and Guild course. But if you download the free approved documents, A through to A, B, C, E, L, M, and P, it's probably all the ones you need really. Um, this criteria is in those. Um, so, anyway, familiarize yourself in any, in any way that you want. But um, if you if you want to spend a bit of money, just get the uh, building regulations book. Can't really uh, complain with that. And you'll notice I haven't, I'm not using the 18th edition content. I have the 18th edition content, but I'm not using it. This is staying honest to the current version, the current standard. I won't be using 18th edition until until it comes in next month. So, we've got to look into the installation of the extra low voltage downlighters in zones one and two of both bathrooms, the methods of providing electrical protection for buried cables in the walls, one method of providing a means of earth into the workshop, and that's 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 interesting because remember it's a metal framed workshop. Maximum minimum melting heights of switches and sockets respectively, and the number of low energy lighting outlets and installed relic relative to the general purpose lighting of the installation. Some of these questions are directed to the wine rig, some of these questions are directed to the building rig, some of these questions have a little bit from both. Okay, so, I'm going to use both documents, really, as I go through this one. ELV down lights in zones 1 and 2 of both bathrooms. I'm going to stick with the wine regulations for this one, because it's mainly wanting me to point out that we need to think of There, we've got in zones one and two, the luminaires, and it also tells us, if I can put my PowerPoint to work, there we go. It also tells us that the required external influences for zones one and two is IPX4. Okay, so that's what we get for that. Okay, there's no requirement of self specifically here. It's not that. It's just about the the uh, requirement for the installation of extra low voltage lighting. Now you could also go down the line of oh, you know fire barrier, fire stopping, making sure the lights are fire rated, but there's not really enough in the scenario to actually explain that the um, the lights are going to be installed in a fire barrier 
uh, yes it's a home yes it's going to be lights in the bathroom but it doesn't really want to go down that avenue it just kind of wants make, it wants you to kind of find information via 767 I'm ready for this one now two methods of providing electrical protection for buried cables in the wall well we have 526.202 which gives us the the zonal directions and also gives us the requirement of dot six dot two oh four which gives us the conduit metallic covering earth trunking cell or pelv so those are the protective requirements of BS7671 there is an illustration of this section the the uh, zonal concept in the building regulations document here um, so you know e each of these documents would help in this case all right so the question was two methods of riding electrical protection for buried cables in the walls um, so again you, protection electrical protection you probably want to look at things like uh, you know protecting against mechanical damage or RCDs and things like that one method of providing a means of earthing for the workshop um, key thing with this is the metal frame the clad workshop meaning that the the workshop is of a metal frame so the metal frame technic um, the workshop technically has become an extraneous conductive part because it's in contact with the earth so the question of does it need to be bonded is yes now in the wine regulations there's not going to be much that's specific for workshops but if you go into the building regulations book and you actually look up the the uh, the subject of sheds for example it will actually send you to this section the supplies of outbuildings and it'll tell you you know if if it's an external PME supply and they're exposed conductive parts we either have to take our protective bonding to the exposed conductive part or separately actually make a, a TT system within the actual shed um, again this is considered as an exposed conductive part so there is a need of reference so that's the information there for that one and um, so you could pretty much just go through either of these two options um, as an answer to that one Maximum minimum mounting heights of switches and socket outlets respectively. Now first of all you immediately think of approved document M. So you go to the building regulations again with this one. Heights of switches and sockets and we have the uh, the lines there. So that's it, maximum minimum, that's it. Okay, that would be it, that would be enough. I I would go a little bit extra because I'd be thinking of BS7671 as well. What relevance has BS7671 got to this question? So I would be saying is, well, there's no given height, but the height must be sufficient to avoid damage. And so I'd also just mention 553.1.6. Okay, so whilst these are the the heights that are given, it could be that if we still go to these heights, that there could be a risk of mechanical damage to the socket outlet. So it's worth adding that as a little uh, a little bonus point to that question. Okay, the number of low energy lighting outlets to be installed relative to the general purpose lighting installation. This is obviously, you think about it, the wine regulations doesn't cover anywhere like this with energy efficiency or anything like that yet. But but what we're going to have is um, proof document L. Or again, if you go to the building regulations book, you've got fixed internal, fixed external lighting. And the question was the number of low energy lighting outlets relative to the general. That's pretty much this bit here. Okay. So three quarters, three, um, not less than three quarters, so three out of four of the main dwelling spaces. So the main ha habitational areas, corridors, bedrooms, living rooms. Yeah. Don't make, for example, your three out of four being, you know, uh, lighting in a plinth or lighting in a wardrobe. It needs to be a, a, um, an actual formal luminaire within, within the home. Uh, so three out of four. It used to be it used to be a lot less. It used to be like one in four, I think, or so ten years ago. So they've increased that, and that makes sense with the way things are going. But that's it. That's, so that's um, that's more than adequate to answer that one. So, question one was asking about your understanding to go from wine regs to burn regs. This one you'll notice is actually just really wine regs. Caravan Park has some provision for the connection of a two thirty volt single phase supply. To a touring caravan sighted within the park. 
Describe how such supplies may be installed in order to comply with the regulations related to each of the following. So, you, special installation, special location. We need to go into BS7671. And we need to find 708 caravan parks. So, we go through them. How such supplies may be installed in order to comply with BS767 related to each of the following. The type of wiring system and method of installation. Well, in 708, there will be wiring systems in caravan parks. They should be underground or overhead. Underground is the preferred one. Types of protected device. Yeah. Individual overcurrent protected device in accordance with Chapter 43. Okay, And have individual RCD protection. Location and purpose of the notice. I'm going to skip that one. Okay. Identify the earthing system that may not be used to supply the caravan. That's also in 708. Yeah. It's a TNCS system, the PME. Um, again, this 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 information should be pretty much um, second nature at this point. If you if you're unaware of that, um, and you really want to go to the regs to just confirm or maybe find the regulation number for reference in your in your written answer um, if you're unaware of that then yeah you need to look at your understanding the regulations before you pursue a design course really okay I skipped the third one the location and purpose of the notice to be fixed and that's because it's actually not in 708 it's in the caravans special installation location section 721 so the instructions will be provided and it can be used safely and it will it gives you the information there of the instruction and an example of it. B. The type of rating of the socket outlets to be installed for the pitch supplies and the mounting height given the possibility of flooding or heavy snowfall. Back to 708. Tells us that it'll have to be a 603A92 IP44. Okay. It tells us the height. Yeah. Half a meter to one and a half with flooding or heavy snowfall, then we go over one and a half. And the rating of 16 amps. So all the information's in there. You know, fairly quick to find, really. Three. Is that the last one? Yep, yeah, okay. Three. 400 volt three phase motor operates at full load with the input of 10 kilowatt at 0.8 power factor. Supply for distribution board by three core steel wire armor, 90 degree thermosetting cable, copper. And it's a single circuit clip direct on a BSA 8 2 fuse, 20 meters of run, 35 degree ambient with a maximum volt drop of 5 volts, and calculate some stuff. Okay, so this is obviously, this is, you can see how this is a different area of the design, um, and this is where you may have to actually get your, your calculators out. I did do a video um, in the 2396 series on cable calculations, um, which would help with this. It was a single phase. Uh, this is three phases, only a minor difference with that, and we'll start with that. So, we're going to follow the same principle though, that I showed you in that other video. So we're going to go I, B, I, N, I, T, Z, A, C, I, I, Z, and then volt drop. We're going to go in that flow, alright? So, first thing is the IB, Cal uh, determine the design current. Now with three phase, we obviously do, instead of P over V, it's P over the square root of 3 times 400, which is because of the three phases times power factor. Okay, power factor of 0.8. We'll throw that in here. So you can you can run it in a number of ways. You could do this as 1.73, which is the square root of three, times 400 times that. You can do it in whichever way that you want. But we end up here with 18.04 amp. That's our design current. I don't have much information on the actual characteristics of this load. I know there's a 0.8 power factor, so it'll have some inductive component. But knowing the BS88 fuse is characteristics, I think it's safe with an 18 amp fuse, uh, device to go to a 20 amp fuse. I could have gone higher, but really for this, I would probably state 20 amp, and I might add a note to say that it's considered that this protected device is suitable for this inductive component. But depending on obviously the operation of the motor, this is a problem. It gives you limited information here. Okay. So we're going to go with IB of 1804, IN of 20 amp. And now, yeah, remember this coordination here, IB, IN, IZ. 
state the correct table and columns used in BS767 for the current rating of voltage drop. So what I need to do is obviously go to Appendix 4 and find the right cable type and the information is here for me. So I know it's an armoured cable. I know it's 90 degree thermo setting. I know it's copper. So with that information, I can come here and I can go right, multi-core, armoured, 90 degree thermo setting, copper. Okay. The clip direct is also required for me because that gives me the reference method. So it's there, service clip direct. So I go to the service clip direct and it's a three phase circuit. So I'm going to go for column three. Now I've got 20 amp. So I want the first one above 20 amp. Well, there we go. 1.5 mil 23. So I'm going to start with that. Okay, I'm going to start with that when I actually um, look at my cable. But before I go to that, I may need to adjust the 20. So the correction factors for the ambient temperature. Where's the ambient temperature? There, 35 degrees. Okay, so we'll get that in there. 90 degree thermo setting, 35, 0 0.96. We're gonna apply that in the formula. That'll actually change 20, but not by a lot. So there's 0 0.6. So it's actually, that is IN over CA. Okay, the reason I've gone with IN and not IB is because the load may overload some motor. Okay, normally you may see IB used in this formula sometimes. That's if your load is a fixed load, like a heater. But it's a motor, it can overload, so overload protection will be required. So I'm gonna go with the IN of 20 over the CA rating factor of 0.96. Doesn't have a great impact, does it? 20.83, so I'm still looking at 23 amp, 1.5, good. But what I need to verify is the volt drop. All right, so there's my cable type. What I need to do though is verify this volt drop. Now it does say up here, the volt drop can't exceed five volts. So what I know about the regulations with the uh, 11.5 volt maximum, that's irrelevant. The equipment has specifically um, mentioned that we can't go over five volts. So I need to adjust this possibly. So I need to calculate this. Well, table 4E4A has adjacent to it, table 4E4B. There, okay, again. Three or four core cable, three phase, column four, 1.5, 27 millivolts per amp, 18.04, per meter, 20 meters. Okay, 27 times design current, 18.04, times length, 20 meters, over a thousand, go from millivolts to volts, equals 9.7, equals problem. Okay, well, that's no good. So what I need to do is go to the next one. The next cable up. So I'm gonna redo that. I'm gonna change 27 to 16. Okay, so that's now technically using a 2.5 mil, 16, and we're still knackered, no good. All right, well, I'll go, I'll go up again. Go to four mil, 10. We'll chop that out. We'll put the four mil in. There we go. So actually this 1.5, we're gonna have to change to four mil and that will be our actual volt drop calculation. So that's, that's kind of done the other question at the same time. You'll see here, calculate the actual volt drop. There we go, we've done that and we've swapped the cable to a four mil. Cable size is a four mil because of the volt drop problem. Um, that's that question done. Boom, 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 boom. Yep, done. Four. We're about to carry out an electrical design for the installation to a new swimming pool being added to an existing sport leisure complex. State three reasons why a sport leisure complex may be designed as a special location. Uh, you shouldn't even need to think of the regs but first yes it's a reg specific question but you should think right a sport leisure complex it's going to have swimming pools it's going to have showers it's going to have saunas yeah 
Simple. So you just boom, boom, boom. Write those down. Like that. B. Identify the requirements to be a 767 when underwater luminaires are to be installed in zone zero. Well, we know swimming pools is 702, so if we go to 702, there may just be a section underwater luminaires. Like that. Oh, okay. So, underwater lighting located behind water. Yep, yeah, that's it. We'll, we'll take our answer from that. Oh, no. C. State the limitations that are placed upon the installation of lighting equipment in zone 1 of a swimming pool. Okay, so lighting that's in zone 1, what's the limitations? Alright, so we think about the requirements for that, and we'll see this section in 702. The special requirements for the installation of equipment in zone 1 are swimming pools. And there's a lot of information, but is there anything that's relevant to just lighting? Here. Okay, so this is equipment, 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 but this is lighting. So swim pools where there is no zone two, so just a zone zero and one, lighting equipment supplied by other than cell of source 12 volts. So the lighting can be of cell of 12 volts. If it's not of cell of 12 volts, then maybe installed in zone one on a wall or ceiling provided that and here's your answer. So, self of 12 volts or the circuit is protected by ADS to 415.1.1, which is the 30 mm times 5 by delta N, or the height from the floor is at least 2 meters above the lower limit of zone 1. Okay, in addition, every luminaire will have to be of class 2. So, these are the special considerations. Right. D. State the purpose of the warning notices to the use of the electrical equipment that is to be used in zone zero of a pool. And identify the protective measures to be taken prior to using the equipment stated in D. Okay. So when we look at equipment in zone zero of a pool. Okay. In zone zero and one. We'll see here. Equipment for use in zone zero. Must be protected by self, ADS to 415.1 RCD, and electrical separation. Okay, but the important part here is notice this. It says, which is only intended to be used when people are not in the pools. So this is like pool cleaning equipment and stuff like that. All right, so those are the protective provisions, but there should be a mention of a notice here, and you'll see it right at the bottom. The socket outlet that is supplying it must have a notice to warn the user that this shall only be used if there's no one in the pool. All right, so that's the point of the notice, to warn the users when they actually use that socket that there should be no one in the pool. Five. Heavy goods vehicle compound has an adjacent workshop provision together with a high pressure washing balloting facility for the lorries. Explain the designation criteria in relation to the, each of the following. So designation criteria, so that's, you know, what will affect our, what do we think of when we're going to start selecting equipment and selecting wiring systems? So with access to road lighting and security lighting, I've kind of done them together. And with services in the workshop area and the wash area, I've kind of done them together. So with access road lighting, we'll remember that there is a requirement in the regulations of six meters for overhead cabling if there's any vehicle movement taking place in areas that have vehicle movement if you're going to use that but really we're looking at lighting levels motion sensors etc for our all outdoor lighting installations to 714 in general though we need to make sure that we understand the requirements that they expect the external influence categories to be AA2 to AA4 that's supposed to be and I can't type climate conditions AB2 and AB4 okay so this is the kind of data we need to make sure we verify AD3, which is sprays, and it actually does say in 714 that the equipment must be of IP33 minimum. All right, so those are the specs we're looking for, outdoor lighting. With regards to security, though, you do mention that we also need to think about methods of operation, switching. With security lighting, you don't want the lighting to be constantly on. You need it to be on a sensor, but it doesn't need to... You don't want to create things like glare. 
this is where your knowledge of things like BS5266 would really be helpful as well. Okay. With the workshop area, again, you, you know, I'm not going to go through it all, but, you know, what kind of wiring system are you going to do? I mean, think about the risks of impact. Think about the risks of moisture ingress. Think about the protective measures. So, you know, you're not going to go with white plastics. You're going to go with steel containment, steel armor cabling. And there's mention of valeting, so you're going to have high-pressure jets, which, I mean, I normally go down the revenue at the, the avenue of um, IP69K um, for things like... Um, vehicle cleaning processes but that's not actually in BS7671 yet so you'd stick with IPX5 for now that's a very simple question it's more about your you know what criteria you would use to make decisions on it six why is discrimination necessary the state relationship between short circuit capacity and protective device and the prospective short circuit current uh, question on a final ring circuit and verify the values of ZS. So let's go through these one at a time. So discrimination, I've typed this response because it was just easier than trying to find anything. But um, I've put that discrimination is required to ensure the isolated device only removes the source of energy from the part of the electrical installation affected by the fault condition and does not isolate other parts of the installation. This ensures safety critical equipment, data sensitive equipment, and also simple utilization of the electrical installation is not necessarily impacted from electrical faults. You can write that in your own way, um, but you know what dis you know discrimination is. It's making sure the isolation occurs to the point of fault and doesn't affect other areas. Other things aren't impacting it. You'll get big issues with things like RCDs and discrimination. Um, think about that, you know. But bear in mind, don't mention RCDs in your answer because the question is about overcurrent protection devices. If you go, oh, if I have an RCD at 30 milliamp and then I have another RCD at 30 milliamp and I don't put in a time delay, that's kind of going to take you off, off, of, off of the direction because really, you're talking about overcurrent protection. Okay. Um, B. Relationship between the short circuit capacity of the protective device and the protective short circuit current at the point it is installed. Um, I've just typed that because um, I just... I was, I was running late, um, but there is text in the on-site guide, and I think it may be in Notes 3, about the the um, the braking capacities of the protected devices. The um, the I the I is it I N and I S I think they call it um, for stable and not not in service, etc. etc. Uh, but again, you're, you're if you've got a good understanding on inspection and testing, which you should really have as well, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. So this is my response. I put the short circuit capacity of the protected device is the limiting amount of current that the device can tolerate during a full condition and can be expected to remain operational upon resetting it. If the short circuit capacity is exceeded, then the device is anticipated to operate but then fail to reset. So if we go over the short circuit capacity, I call it braking capacity, but this is what they've used in these questions these days. Um, so it'll fatal. It'll fail to um, close. The prospective short circuit current at the point of the device is installed. Um, it's, it's a measurement or calculation to determine the value of current that will occur at that particular point in the electrical installation in fault conditions between live conductors and between live conductors and earth. Now it does say um, prospective short circuit current, but. I've included my answer between live conductors and earth because obviously I'm thinking of the prospective fault current. Um, if you want to, if you want to be anal about the question, saying prospective short circuit current, then you would scratch that out of your response and you just say prospective short circuit current. You wouldn't mention uh, prospective earth fault current in that. Okay, uh, the prospective fault current must not exceed the prospective device's short circuit capacity. Um, uh, it might just be, you know, I mean, this should be a common, a common uh, knowledge thing. It might just be that your your ability to write that response needs to kind of practice on it. So otherwise, that should be fairly simple. Now this one, um, I've deliberately put something in here because when I did the exam, I had this problem, so I've added it here. So the question is: A final circuit supplies a fixed appliance is wired in a six mil multicore, seventy degree thermoplastic non-armor cable, copper conductors having a CPC of two point five. It's on a thirty-two amp GG fuse to BS eighty-eight two, and the value of ZD is 0.35, and The length of the run is forty meters. Calculate the value of ZS. 
So, bear in mind there's no ambient temperature given. What I've not been able to do is verify if I need to adjust the resistance values of R1 plus R2. This is what you need to do, is you need to calculate the R1 plus R2 to determine what the ZS is. Okay. Now it says here, final circuit to a fixed appliance. Okay, so it's not it's not a ring final or anything like that. It's just a single radial circuit. So to find ZS, we need to know that ZS is equal to ZE plus R1 plus R2. We have ZE, we need to find R1 plus R2. For that, we need to know what the size of the line conductor is and the size of the protective conductor is. Well, that's there in the question. And we need to know where to find that information. And if you go to Guidance Notes 3 or the on-site guide, you'll find this table. Um, this is in Guidance Notes 3, table B1. I think in the on-site guide, it's Appendix I, maybe, H, I, J, but I think, try I. Same table, all right? Um, in this, you'll see, okay, well, the six mole conductor, this is, this is why I say, look, these values are given at 20 degrees. Now, if I'm installing my cable and I'm running at 25 degrees or 30 degrees, there are under this table factors of adjustment. I've not given an ambient temperature, so I'm going to go with these by default. I had this exact scenario in a question in my old design course, and I didn't have a temperature. And so when I wrote my answer out, I actually mentioned as a little asterisk at the top, I'll mention, I mentioned that there's no ambient temperature given and so no adjustment for ambient temperature could be made. So assuming 20 degrees, because that's what this data is given at. So six mil on its own, 3.08 milliohms per meter. Two five on its own, 7.41 milliohms per meter. Well, R1 and R2 is them together. So 3.08 plus 7.41, that's R1 plus R2, times the length of 40 meters. 0.42. So my R1 plus R2 of the circle is 0.42. Now that I know that, there's those two highlighted there. Now that I know that, I can then add that 0.42 to the ZE of 0.35 to get my ZS of 0.77. Okay? That's my value of ZS, 0.77. The full current, well, that's just Ohm's law, isn't it? So the full current is UO over ZS. So 230 over 0.77 is 299 amp. It's fairly simple, isn't it? All right. Verify the value of ZS obtained and see compliance with BS7671. Well, I have my 0.77 ZS. I then go to BS7671. I find that my 32 amp GG fuse here. Bear in mind, as it was a final circuit, I'm going for the 0.4 second disconnection table. Okay. Final circuit. That's why I've gone to this table. So I go, okay, well, BS882, 32 amp. 0.99 maximum, 0.77. Yeah, it's good. So, fine. Okay, seven. BS7671 requires switch gear to confirm the requirements for isolation switching, be it functional, emergency, mechanical maintenance, etc. Control and protection against overload and short circuit current. The figure below shows the equipment for operating a group of conveyors. State using the reference to the numbers given the functional functions performed by each of the item equipment with reference to isolation, switching, control, and protection. Um, so I think it's in, um, is it 537? Or somewhere in 53. There's a big table which tells you, you know, all these different device types. And it then says, you know, there's a, there are columns for um, emergency switching and isolation, and there's yeses and nos and things like that. And this is what this is trying to determine. It's, it's, it's saying, okay, you've got a big isolation switch, but what is that a method of switching for? Is it switching for emergency operation, or is it switching for mechanical maintenance, or just switching for isolation, or does it serve a multiple function? Um, and that's kind of what this is going with. So... In the case of the, you know, here's the consumer unit. So this primary isolator is really a isolation switch. But it'll be a switch that has an indicator of off and on. And you'll know if you look in the regulations, that can also be utilized as a method of switching for mechanical maintenance. It won't be used for mechanical maintenance because it's not really switching off a conveyor. But it technically is recognized as a switch for mechanical maintenance. Okay. Now, in the board, the protective devices will provide isolation. They are also accepted 
as a functional switch. If you actually look in the table, a BSCN6098 MCB is ticked as functional. So technically, okay, it could be used for functional switching and protection. Okay, and then you've got three here. So we have mechanical maintenance and isolation. And then we have protection within the actual control assembly and then control. And then we have this remote stop, which will be an emergency switch, which also carries the isolation because it removes the source of energy. And then in here we'll have again isolation and mechanical maintenance. Okay, that's what it's, it's asking you to recognize the type of switching that is required. The, the idea here is what we want to do is make sure that if I'm going to have a board that feeds a control panel, that I know that there has to be a source of isolation. It doesn't necessarily have to be a source of emergency switching that can be installed remotely. Yeah. Otherwise, if we get our switching types wrong, then it might, it might create an unsafe condition. The second question was, in addition to these requirements mentioned, they state a further function required for the contactor starter. Well, contactor starter for motors, three phase, etc. Uh, under voltage protection. Yeah. They also provide under voltage protection. Eight. An earth electrode is used in conjunction with an LCD protecting a TT installation. An earth ball loop impedance test may be used to obtain the resistance of the earth electrode. Describe the procedure. Okay, so you may immediately be thinking, oh, it's an electrode, oh, it's an earth electrode resistance tester. And But no, read the question. It's actually saying, no, no, no. You're on an RC supply. No, you have a TT supply with an RCD present. That means we can use a loop impedance tester. So, how are you going to do that? Again, I could go through all that, but it's 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 here in Guys Notes 3. Okay, test method E, measurement using an earth loop impedance tester. Switch it off before, disconnect the earthing conductor, remove the parallels. Okay, so the instructions are there. Having obtained the value of earth electro resistance by the method stated, describe the necessary actions of each of the following. Provide a value of satisfactory for the method of earth fault protection. So there's the information here that is required. Yeah, so you need to main thing here is to verify that the voltage is less than 50 volts um, similarly if you're going to use like with an RCD we, we let's let's say it's a a 300 milliamp RC, I think it's like 167 ohms if it's the 30 milliamp it's 1667 so you know the, that's all about making sure 50 volts isn't exceeded um, so you can work that out and what you should do if it's if it's unsatisfactory so what the actions are all right um, so that's that's all in there for that one. Nine, figure two below shows a ring final circuit in two five multi core thermoplastic non armored cable with a one point five mil CPC. Okay, method requires measurements at each socket outlet and the resistance per meter for the two point five mil copper conductor is zero point zero zero seven four ohms, and for the one five it's zero point zero zero no sorry zero point zero one two ohms at normal operating temperature. Calculate each of the following. So the line are neutral at each socket and the R1 R2 for the ring. So that's also at each socket. Alright, remember the R1 R2 will be the same everywhere. So you know, a bit tricky, they, they suggest it's a different thing. It's R1 R N, it's R1 R2. It does say here per meter for the copper. Okay. So what we need to do is go, oh okay, well that's per meter and it's Mm, where's the length? Oh, there's the length in the drawing. Three and five and two and ten and nine and six and three and two. Uh, three, ten, twenty-nine, thirty-five, fifty, forty. Yeah, so we have a forty-meter run. Times that by forty to give you the value of R one and the value of R n times that by 40 to give the value of R2 and then calculate R1, RN and R1, R2 okay so R1, RN is little r1 plus little rn over 4 so R1 is 0 0.0074 times 40 is 0 0.296 R1 will be the same so 0 0.296 plus 0 0.296 over 4 is 0 0.15 ohms for R2 0 0.012 is the value of R2 and that times 40 is 0 0.48. I didn't actually type that in, but that is it. And 0 0.296 from before. 
and that gives us 0 0.19. So there's our R1, R end, there's our R1, R2. 10. State the information and the precautions to be taken prior to conducting an insulation resistance test within an insulation. Within an insulation? I think that means within an installation. Okay. Um, yeah. Bear in mind I'm also doing 18th edition content right now and I'm knackered. Explain might be necessary to subdivide a large electrical installation when conducting an insulation resistance test. Then state the values of test voltages required. All right. So... The information precautions to be taken, I can go through that, but you've heard it again and again, but it's actually there in the guidance notes three. So the information to take is any sensitive equipment and the actions to be taken will be to remove the sensitive equipment. Okay, the information and precautions. All right, the information is what sensitive equipment is there. The precautions are let's take them away from the test or provide limitations on that. It may be necessary to subdivide it. Um, I couldn't find a specific bit of text that covered this in guidance notes or anything, but it's a common understanding with the... Uh, this is this is why on your testing courses we do that parallel thing, 1 over RT equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3, to get us to understand that if we put many, many, many circuits under an insulation resistance test, we're going to have a lower value due to the additional parallels along the run of the circuit. The longer the cable, the more the actual parallels are within the cable between the two conductors. And technically then, the longer the cable is, the lower its insulation resistance because of the parallels within it. Now if I go to a supply and I go on the main supply intake and I have a distribution board, the requirement of the regulation, if you actually look in, um, well, chapter 61, but it'll be chapter 64 soon, um, it actually, you know, it tells you that the the insulation resistance test will be carried out the board with the board isolated. So I go to that board, I turn the supply off, and I have that board. And if that board feeds another board, I turn those boards off, and I just so test that board itself. And then I'll do the test again for that board. If I have all circuits on, and then they go to another board with all those circuits on, all these parallels, I'm going to start creating parallel resistances and my value of insulation resistance will become um, affected and I'll get an inaccurate reading. Um, so we have to subdivide it to avoid um, false, false readings that can be created by the numerous parallels from further distribution. Responses like that would be perfect. Uh, but that's the idea, you're removing the additional parallels created by further distribution and final circuits. C, state the values of test voltage required and minimum accessible values of insulation resistance for each of the following. Uh, you can just take that from the table in the guidance notes, really. Domestic ring final circuit, a 230 volt circuit, 500 volts DC. Industrial ring at 75, industrial control circuit at 750. Okay, what's above 500 volts? We'll go to 1000 volts. Extra low voltage, well, that's self and pell, we'll go down to 250. But do remember to state DC with those as well. All right. Um, that's question 10, I think, done. Uh, I don't know how long that's taken to fly through. Probably probably the best part of 45 minutes or so. Uh, but remember, that's a three-hour... It's a three-hour paper. All right. Um, familiarity with reference material is great. Um, some of the questions, though, as you go through that, you should really just know, um, and you shouldn't really need to go and you know reference and as I say I used the three hours fully um, not so much because I was looking for the answers but more because I was trying to better present the answers really um, I sound like a bit of an idiot a uh, bit of a snob but yeah um, go with your instinct on the questions and stuff but you know use the reference material it's, it's, it's you know it's an open book take 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 the resources with you take the um, take the regulations take the building regulations um, it's absolutely, accept, you know, it's absolutely fine. Um, right, I'm gonna. Well, this we're done with this one. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start putting in some content to create to help support the model project that I've also created. But I'm also right now working on the 18th edition content. Have decided how best to present that um, because uh, I might put some free content on actually because you know 
bit a lot of people who are confusing things with the 18th edition so i might just put some free content out there in, in the next few weeks we'll see um but yeah um i hope this has helped i've gone through it nice and quick because you could pause it and you can find information it's just more, more you know this isn't really showing you how i answer questions it's showing you how i navigate really and i navigate a response um, but if you want any further advice on anything or questions or me to go through things more detail then add a comment um, and I'll respond when I get some time and I will uh, do as best I can for you. Alright guys, um, yeah, bye.